This is indeed a great event. It's always a pleasure uh, to come to the library and to work with the wonderful library staff and you know, congratulations to Ben Stone and John Mustaine and all of you for producing the great monument that is the Tannenbaum uh, Collection Catalog. And thank you to Anne Tannenbaum for having a dad who collected these books and, and giving them to the library. Uh, it's really tremendous. Um, the, the title of my talk tonight is Discovering the New World. Uh, and I'm going to be taking you through some of the highlights of the collection. Uh, Mike told me that I could talk for 30 minutes, but I really could have talked for 30 days about the items in this collection, but don't worry, I won't keep you for 30 days. I'll keep you for 30 minutes. Um, discovering the new world, I also mean, however, as something that we do with our students here at Stanford through collections such as this one. This is a great research university, but great research universities are also great teaching universities. And this is a great teaching collection. What I have put on the table in front of you, the handout, this feels like a class, you have a handout, uh, which you may now look at. Uh, this is a, um, a piece of paper called uh, How to Discover a Rare Book. And we bring students in here during the second week of their freshman year to the Barkus room downstairs to look at items from the 17th and 18th century. We do this with the help of John Mustaine. And we teach students who are as young as 17. We've actually started doing this in the new Summer Humanities Institute where we have high school juniors and seniors who come here for three weeks in the summertime, the first thing we do on the first afternoon is we bring them to look at these books in this collection. And we ask them to discover, to learn to discover a book from a time that was very, very long ago and to see that a whole new world opens up to them. How do you examine a book from the 17th century? Um, it's often a myth, I think, that the humanities do not require any specialized expertise, that you can just dip into the humanities at any time. But we like to show them at the very beginning of their Stanford career that the humanities require skill, they require mastery, and they require expertise. And this is what one of the things that the Tannenbaum uh, collection helps us to do. So they learn to become paleographers, uh, rare book experts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I wanted to first uh, call that out as one of the great virtues of this gift to the library, that it helps us not just to be a great research university, but to be a great teaching university for young people uh, as young as young as 15 and 16. So uh, that, that is uh, a wonderful feature of the Tannenbaum collection. So now we can start to look at some of the highlights from this collection. Uh, this is a great collection uh, for helping us to explore one of the great moments in human history, which was the moment of contact between the old world of Europe and the new world that uh, was of the Americas, which of course, uh, you know, lay unknown to Europe uh, before 1492. And I wanted tonight just to focus on three major areas of how the Tannenbaum Collection helps us to gain some purchase on some of the central questions of the 17th and 18th century. So one of the first major questions uh, is, who were the American Indians? And this question, in fact, has never been answered until today. There are still a lot of archeologists worrying about the question of who are the American Indians? And if you read uh, the New York Times often enough, you see that there's a lot of interesting debate about this. Um, the first uh, thesis I have about discovering the American Indians is that we never see anything new. We are unable to see anything entirely new. We only see things through the reference point of other things that we already know. And this 
fact, this historical fact, is nowhere better represented than in the multitude of images that emerged from the, quote, discovery of the American, American Indians. And this is uh, one of them. This is one of the fir, uh, images out of the very first century of British American exploration in North America. So uh, you'll probably immediately notice one thing about this image, which is that she's hoisting <laughs> a human leg um, in, in her hand, this, this Indian uh, princess here. Now, it's easy to think that this ties into the European obsession with cannibalism, because we know that this is one of the things that 17th century Europeans were obsessed with. But in fact, um, there's, there's been a lot of research lately done about the trade in human body parts among um, Indians. We know scalping as, as the, the, uh, the most famous of these, but there was, in fact, uh, a trade in whole human heads, which you can see um, over there arrayed on the left, uh, and in fact, in easily portable body parts, such as lower legs and feet. Sorry, if, so I'm, I know you're eating. I apologize for this, but it's true. Um, so, so I have to tell you. Um, and this was because of the, the society that the Indians uh, had the, the way of war that they conducted required a lot of reciprocity. Um, and this exchange in body parts in acts of war um, was, was a feature of that. So this artist is actually probably accurately representing something that we retroactively are seeing as cannibalism, but I don't think she's about to eat that. Um, I think she's about to probably exchange it uh, with, with a neighboring group of Indians. If she looks familiar to you, however, and this is where my thesis is gonna kick in, it's because she is probably being modeled on pictures of Diana the Huntress. When you put those images side by side, you really see that the Indian on the right is no Indian at all. This is merely a representation of a figure that has been known in Europe uh, since classical antiquity. And of course, an, an Indian woman would never have hunted Hunted. Indian men hunted, Indian women did not hunt, they farmed, um, and, and yet she's being absorbed into this uh, European way of understanding uh, in Indian people. So that's, that's the first thesis that we try to convey to students as they are exploring these early books, is that knowledge is very accretive and knowledge is very complicated, and they always have to approach these texts uh, with great care and, and great nuance. This is the second series of images that I wanted to show to you about the discovery of the American, American Indians. This comes from uh, Jonathan Carver's wonderful travels through the interior parts of North America in the years 1766, 1767, and 1768. This is a remarkable voyage for being first before the American Revolution, but it's the, one of the first times that a British American uh, crosses over the Mississippi into the Trans-Mississippi West. Most European settlement at this time, like 99% of it, uh, was east of the Appalachians, which were thought to be um, this vast, vast, and almost unclimbable mountain range. More about that later. Um, but Jonathan Carver goes on this trip into uh, Michigan, into Wisconsin, into Minnesota. He's one of the first people to use the word Oregon in a book, and he begins to speculate when he sees the Great Plains extending out in front of him that there must be some kind of mountain range out there to the west. Again, more about that later. But this is a remarkable voyage because what was out there in the Trans-Mississippi West was really almost entirely unknown to British Americans at this time. Most of what was known uh, came through French accounts with the, the famous fur trappers, the coureurs de bois, um, and the Jesuit fathers who penetrated deeply into the North American interior. But for the British, it was new. For the British, it was also very, very dangerous. These Indians were often unallied uh, with the British and either didn't know about the British or were actively opposing uh, the British 
um, and were uh, in league with the French. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing an image um, that, that looks very peaceful. Uh, there's an Indian warrior holding uh, a, a, a bow on the left and presumably his wife uh, on, on the right and, and a little baby holding her hand. Um, this, when you look at it long enough and you've seen enough uh, 17th century paintings from Europe, you say, aha, we're in Arcadia. This is where we are. There is no weather. We're in a timeless place. You see, there's no weather. There's smoke coming out of the teepee in the middle of the uh, exterior. The smoke is going straight up, you know, so there's no wind in Arcadia. It's a scene that is beautifully framed uh, with, with trees on either side, as, as you all know from, from this tradition of painting. Um, the, the Indians are standing in classical contrapposto. Um, and weirdly, there's no vineyards in sight, but the mother and the baby are holding uh, grapes. So <laughs> just in case the Bacchanal were, were to break out, they're ready. Um, Surprisingly enough, the next image looks pretty much exactly the same. Different Indians, but the father's on the left, his wife and child are on the right, the smoke from the dwelling um, is, is there, and again, the little basket signals that there is some kind of settled agriculture going on here. Again and again, Carver reproduces these images. Uh, what's going on? Well, what I think is going on is a fantasy for the peaceful invasion of this new territory. This is a very famous series of, of canvases from Europe in which the allegory of Mars marrying Venus and having a little love child in the form of Cupid shows the reconciliation of war with love and um, a happy future uh, in the form of this adorable chubby uh, Puto there on, on the right, Doesn't, don't you think that's it? I think that's it. Um, so Carver's illustrations are not innocent. They are projections both of what he has seen but also of what he as a British American wants to see. Now we know this was all done before the American Revolution. The book was published during the American Revolution after the American Revolution, when the Treaty of Paris of 1783 was signed, ending the hostilities, um, then all bets were off. The French were out of North America forever, uh, except for some business down in Louisiana. Um, and, and really, the Trans-Mississippi West had been opened up to the British with all of the diplomatic problems with the Indians that this brought. So this really is a timely, um, meditation on what the future he hoped would bring. So we have to be very careful about those Indian images. This is the final series of, of images I want to show you about uh, the discovery of the American Indians. Now we're all the way into the 19th century. You've doubtless seen some of the paintings uh, that George Catlin uh, uh, painted, he painted over 600 of these beautiful canvases at a moment in American history in the 1830s and 1840s when for the first time the trope of the vanishing Indian uh, gained common currency in America. This was just now the beginning of the reservation system. Andrew Jackson uh, as president had expelled the Indians of the East Coast along the Trail of Tears in 1831 uh, to take their new places in the trans Mississippi West. The Indians were being removed out of the East Coast. These are some of the first generations now um, of white Americans on the East Coast to be born without direct contact with an Indian during their lives. This was not the case in, in the 18th century. George Catlin's own mother had been taken captive by Indians as a young girl, and he, he remained fascinated by her stories of that experience. So he went out into the Trans-Mississippi West to look at the Indians, in his words, before they died out. Um, so he's painting something that he believes is already in the past. Um, so it's so interesting how in the space of 50 or 60 years, we've gone from Carver, who is painting a vision of the Indians as a future, to just now, half a century later, George Catlin painting the Indians as though they were in the past. So 
Uh, the, here they're, they're playing lacrosse, uh, which is um, interesting. He, he, he loved that, uh, capturing the Indians at play. And I just couldn't leave you without showing this remarkable painting here. So what's in the, the tent of, of, of an Indian in, in, you know, no attempt at Europe, Europeanization at all. This is, you know, in, in, in the body paint, et cetera. Um, what we have in the Tannenbaum collection are the wonderful series of engravings made from the Catlin uh, painting. So what that means is that they were able to reach a very, very broad audience. So these became some of the best known images of American Indians to circulate in the 19th century. Uh, so this is one example, again, of how, how the classic sized Indian has completely disappeared from the repertoire of what Americans are seeing. There's no Dianas uh, any, anymore. Um, and and this, this, is, this is Catlin's vision of how the Indians are a thing of the past. He's showing, this is the same man here. He's showing the Indian coming to Washington, D.C to create diplomatic relationships uh, with the US government and then coming back to his tribe, which is represented on the right with teepees fully civilized according to white mores, but still looking oddly out of place. So Catlin is, is really charting a way for a future for America in which the Indians are no longer part of it. The Tannenbaum Collection has many, many books that show this remarkable transformation uh, in American ideas of who the Indians are. Let me turn to the next uh, series of, of um, wonderful things that the Tannenbaum Collection shows us, Inventing God's Country. So, you know, now when you think of the great thing that America is, you think of the Grand Canyon, or you think of Yellowstone, or you think of Yosemite. Uh, but in fact, there's been a whole array of natural monuments in American history that have each taken their turn as the greatest thing that America has to offer that will show the world that this, in fact, is God's country. It's not somewhere else. God's country is right here. Um, in the 19th century, it was the mania for Niagara Falls. There's a million pa paintings of Niagara Falls that emerged in the 19th century. Uh, my students one year had a, had a wonderful class about that at, at the Cantor which had some paintings uh, that, that we were able to look at. But the first um, uh, the first God's country in American history was the Natural Bridge of Virginia. Now, somebody told me that, in fact, Mike Keller himself uh, lived near the Natural Bridge of Virginia. Is that true? Is that? Oh, <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> all right. So the Natural Bridge of Virginia, I did a, a very... Um, informal poll of the Natural Bridge of Virginia among my colleagues at the Stanford Humanities Center. I said, have you heard of the Natural Bridge of Virginia? And the answer was the Natural Bridge of what? So nobody, nobody's heard of the Natural Bridge of Virginia anymore. But it was the most famous monument uh, of America in the late 18th century. And we see its career emerging uh, in the Tannenbaum catalog. So it first uh, begins to appear in travel, uh, travel writing, such as this, the Marquis de Chastelux, his travels in North America. He's not just traveling, this guy. He's here with the French, who are helping the Americans to win the American Revolution. So his travels are not with a suitcase, right? They're with an army um, to, to help the Americans. Uh, but he stops along the way and admires the Natural Bridge of Virginia. And of course, it's so important for Americans to have these evidences of God smiling upon their project. They don't have a classical antiquity in America. They don't have a Middle Ages. The only thing they have is nature. So of course, at the moment of nation formation in the 1780s and 1790s, there's the discovery of the monuments that are gonna show that even though France has um, you know, the Louvre and Roman monuments, America has the natural bridge which is better. So it appears here. It appears very famously in Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia. The Tannenbaum collection has the 1801 edition of the notes on the state of Virginia. Um, the first major uh, kind of authorized edition of this publication is 1787. And I've just highlighted the parts here where Jefferson invokes the 18th century categories uh, of Edmund Burke, of the sublime and the beautiful. And you know, the merely beautiful is just something that's pretty, right? But the sublime, 
time is the thing, the emotion the, of awe, of terror, that helps you to know that you have been touched by God. And he distinctly says in the notes on the state of Virginia that, that this is the most sublime of God's creations. He loves it so much he buys it um, and he visits it a lot. So that's what happens <laughs> to, uh, to the natural bridge of Virginia. And, and we just keep getting paintings of it over the course of the early 18th century. Um, I, I have my little pointer here. I wanted to show you. There's, they, they, they've done a. Oh, is this is this working? Where am I pointing it? Am I doing this right? Oh, here. Look, there's people down here. And if you could look closely, it's a white woman with her black servant. So we know we're in Virginia, um, in the antebellum period here. Uh, so looking up from the bottom, and here we are looking down from the top. I call this the God shot. You know, we're looking down as though as though we were God. But this is one of the last paintings of the Natural Bridge of Virginia. So what I like about this, when students work on um, these series of books, is that they see that the great things in America rise and fall, and that while we may all go to the Grand Canyon today, who knows where we're going to be going in the next hundred years as, as God's most majestic creations um, move, move somewhere else. All right, let me conclude with the third uh, kind of major area that the Tannenbaum Collection helps us to see. Um, mapping the American West, it, it's really hard to put ourselves back in the 18th century, because we know so much about the American Revolution, it's really hard for us to recall how little was actually known about the American interior beyond the Appalachians well into the early 19th century. It was really terra incognita in so many ways. But this began to change. Um, especially with the thing I'm going to show you at the very end, which is the extraordinary map that was produced in the wake of the Lewis and Clark expedition uh, of 1803 to 1805. So I wanted to start you off by showing how little was known in the 17th century. And this is a hilarious map. This is like that Saul Steinberg vision of New York, you know, that, that there's New York, there's the Hudson River, and then, you know, Japan is kind of beyond. The whole American continent has been reduced to an inch long strip. This is exactly the same. I wonder if Steinberg actually saw this. So, so what are you seeing here? This, this is an odd map in that north is over here. So north is on the right. So here we are. We're in Virginia, which is really, really big. This is, this is 1662, by the way, a map from 1662. Um, so Virginia is here. Here's Maryland. Um, and then up here is like New York, Cape Cod, and Canada. Um, and this is the Appalachians these mountains here, <laughs> and then here's the Pacific. <laughs> Isn't that great? So, so all of North America is this little one-inch slice right here, um, and we're, then we're already at the Sea of China and, and the Indies. This is just such a lovely map. You can go to the Library of Congress website and find this, and, and it's, um, I, I love the little cute animals here, and, and it just, uh, it, it really rewards um, time spent with it. But this is an example of what was known in 1662. Jamestown was founded in 1607, so we're over half a century later, and it's not that much that, that is known. So uh, things improve a little bit here with Jonathan Carver's map. Uh, we're already begin, which you know I showed you some of the images of, of Carver earlier. We've got a lot of filling in here, but this remains very unknown, and therefore the subject of some mythological speculation and hopes. People are always kind of mapping their hopes. Uh, and one of the hopes is that, this is why I put an arrow here, is that there's this thing called the River of the West, the Great River of the West. The Great River of the West is very conveniently going to open up a huge water passage that's going to connect the Pacific to the Missouri River. So here's, you know, the Missouri is kind of going up like this. So this is the information that is circulating in the late 18th century. This is all Spanish territory right down here. So they want to be careful down here. The other theory that they're operating with at this time, you know, absent kind of um, empirical data, it's the classical theory of symmetrical geography, which says that if you have a large land mass, um, any 
feature that appears on one side also appears on the other side in roughly equal proportion. So what they think is that, there, well, there's the Appalachians here, um, and so there should be some Appalachians over here. Um, nice low mountains <laughs> that aren't too hard to get across without supplemental oxygen. Um, so things are going to change when Thomas Jefferson uh, famously dispatches Meriwether Lewis um, and William Clark. I, I, love, I love these words, they're so noble. The object of your mission is to explore the Missouri River and such principal streams of it as by its course and communication with the waters of the Pacific Ocean, whether the Columbia, Oregon, Colorado, or any other river may offer the most direct and practicable water communication across the continent for the purposes of commerce. I just wish presidents wrote like that still, you know, the object of your mission. It sounds so you know, inspiring. So off they go on this expedition. 50 people go, only one man dies. Dies. It's an extraordinary expedition, and he dies of appendicitis, so you know, he doesn't even get killed by a grizzly bear. Um, they find many things. This is where they go. Uh, you can see they start in St. Louis. They go up the Missouri. They have an extraordinary winter. They're, they're snowed in for about four or five months with the Mandan. Um, we have the complete Lewis and Clark journals here in the library in the modern edition. If you ever are here and don't know what to do, <laughs> like you don't have enough to read, go and read about the winter with the Mandan. It's really wonderful. Um, and then finally, they get to the Pacific Ocean, turn around and come back. All the while, they're shipping plant specimens, bird specimens, and then finally, the extraordinary journals. Um, this is what they are able to do in the aftermath of the Lewis and Clark expedition. And these are the end papers of the Tannenbaum catalog, a beautiful choice um, for, for the, the end papers. We have this also displayed in, in the case over here. So what are you seeing here? This is the West. This is the Trans-Mississippi West, revealed for the first time with some degree of accuracy, thanks to what Lewis and Clark were doing. Here's Lake Superior. Here are the Rocky Mountains, um, and here's the Pacific Ocean. Uh, there were other expeditions going on at roughly the same time. The Spanish were sending expeditions in, into the West as well. But Lewis and Clark were carefully keeping track of what they were seeing, who they were meeting, um, and, and uh, what kinds of animals and plants they were uh, able, able to discover. So let me just point you some really neat things about this map, and then you can rush over to the case and look at it for yourself. Um, the first thing that stands out on this map is that above all else, the Lewis and Clark expedition was a commercial expedition. They wanted to find a water route to the Pacific because they wanted to trade with China and Japan, and that was it. Um, so along the way, they've written on the map the location of economically profitable places. So we have Boone's Salt Works here, and up here, uh, the, the rich, rich lead mines, not just lead mines, rich lead mines um, here that I've highlighted in, in red. So these were carefully marked on the map for future use. Another thing that the Lewis and Clark expedition was able to do was to determine with some precision the location of many of the tribes of Indians in the Trans-Mississippi West, which were um, unknown to, to the British uh, Americans of the 18th century and to US citizens in the 19th century. They launched the first statistical analysis of the American Indians in 1805 and 1806. This is the first time the word statistics, a very modern enlightenment word, is used to try to understand the population of the American Indians, which of course we know are excluded from the US Constitution for purposes of taxation. So why do they need to count them? You know, if you only count people for the purposes of taxation, why do they want to count the Indians? Well, they want to count the Indians because the Indians are still a live threat. They're mostly counting warriors, 
when they are counting the Indians. So they give numerous Indian counts. Um, here we have 200 souls, we have 3,000 souls, uh, 400 souls. You may ask yourself, why are these all rounded numbers? It's because there's a very old convention actually from the classical world of how you count warriors um, and what kinds of uh, mathematical um, projections you do to then uh, calculate how many total Indians there are. So Indian counts of this nature are very, very typical for this time period. There aren't actually exactly 400 Indians. This is just the way they count them. But they're counting warriors because the warriors are still dangerous. So in 1806, we're still at the moment where diplomatically the Indians represent a commercial possibility but also a military threat. Contrast this again with Catlin, who just 30 years later is painting the Indians like they're going out of style. So it's really amazing uh, how this, uh, sorry, wrong, wrong gizmo here. I'm gonna leave you with the final slide uh, for, for the evening. <laughs> this is my favorite part of the map. This is when they get to the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> And they write, these mountains are covered with snow. <laughs> they, <laughs> they get to the Rocky Mountains and they realize these are not the Appalachians. These mountains are really, really high. They try to bring their canoes over them, but of course they're way up above 10,000 feet uh, march, marching through the snow. And this is the thing that is written across the mountain range. And, and it's clearly visible on the map over here. I checked uh, before I started talking. These mountains are covered with snow. It's just so charming uh, and it's such a reminder that the past is, is, is about books, of course, beautiful books like we have in the Tannenbaum collection, but the past is always mostly about human beings, the human beings of the past and the human beings that we want our students to become today as they are schooled in, in this remarkable collection. Thank you. What do your students find the most difficult thing to grasp about what you teach them when you teach from this collection? Um, that, that is a great question. They, they always cluster around the same series of questions. Um, and and John, John is always with me in the room when we're running this class. Um, okay, so just to be honest with you, the thing that always stumps them at first until we clarify it is the long S. Um, you know, in the eighth, there's that S that looks like an F. And so we send them over to, to look at the books and they think that, that there's all these weird spellings in the 18th century. Everybody's using the, the F promiscuously and so we have, to, we have to explain that. You know, I think the most difficult thing, and this is why I think it's so important to get them in there right away, um, is that it's a world that is so different from ours that all of the cultural reference points are gone. Um, and so we really have to sort of transport them to another planet to explain the true complexity of the 18th century. So of course, they all immediately go to the things that they know, the additions of common sense. Um, they've heard of Thomas Paine, you know, they know that this was an important pamphlet, but they realize how much they do not know and also how incredibly wonderful the 17th and 18th century was. They find kinds of books that they didn't know existed, dictionaries, uh, travel guides, all of these things. Um, but, but that's really, I think, the, the crux of what we're doing is we're trying to teach them that the past really is a foreign country and that you have to really study it in order to understand it. But they get that uh, very, very quickly. So I would say that's the most difficult thing, is the abandonment of all cultural reference points, aside from the American Revolution. Other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you.